everyone to the September 24, 2002 meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Zoning Board of Appeals. We have a light board tonight. Um, we have uh, Jay Chapmas, Stephen LaPlante, Jack Keneally, I'm David Backer. We are missing Catherine Miller, Penny Jordan, and Michael Tranfaglia, but we do have a quorum, so we will get started. If someone else joins us, so be it, but if they don't, uh, we'll proceed. Uh, first item on the agenda is to approve the minutes of the July 23, 2002 meeting. Comments from board members on the minutes of the July 23 meeting. Hearing none, could I have a motion from someone to approve the minutes? Motion, Mr. Keneally. Second. Having not been present, I will abstain. Second. Dr. Chapman, second. Those in favor of approval of the minutes with uh, Mr. LaPlante abstaining. Three in favor, zero opposed. The minutes are approved. Uh, next item on our agenda is one item of old bus business, and that is to hear the request of Stephen and Sarita Solomon for Kettle Cove Road, tax map U16, lot 7A, for a front property line variance of 9 feet from the required 25 feet, a left side property line variance of 5 feet from the required 25 feet, and a right side property line variance of 15 feet from the required 25 feet to replace the existing ranch with a one and a half story cape with attached porch. Um, are the Solomons here tonight? Um, we have carried this item of business forward on our agenda for the last three or four meetings at least. And at our last meeting, um, we had directed uh, Mr. Smith as the code enforcement officer to send the Solomons a letter um, telling them that if they didn't submit an application uh, by this month that they would have their matter removed from the agenda um, and that they would have to reapply with a new application fee. We have in our packet a copy of Mr. Smith's August 2, 2002 letter to the Solomons. Uh, Mr. Smith, have you received any reply from them or an application? I have, I have not received any word from them, nor have I received a, a complete application. <clears throat> well, I think it's fair to assume then that at least at this stage they're not prepared to go forward. Whether they still have an interest or not, um, I have no idea. But uh, with the board's consent, I suggest that we simply uh, drop the matter from our agenda at this point and not carry it forward. Um, and if they submit an application, a complete application, it'll be put back on the agenda. Is that we'll, we'll, sufficient? We'll have to, we'll start no, yes. And if they, now have they ever submit, have they submitted any application? There was an application submitted, um, hence we started advertising, we reviewed the application and found it to be uh, in need of a lot of work and I notified them they in turn decided to hire uh, Northeast Civil Solutions to do a appropriate application. Um, Northeast started on that, but I guess they have lost communications with the Solomons also. Okay. All right, well, let's drop it from the agenda unless you receive a new application from them. Well, let's clarify that. It's dropped from the agenda and then they have a right to reapply as anybody would at some future date. 
Th that's right. Because the way you, the way you, it sounded like you, if they put an application in, they could be put back on without re advertisement. Thank you. And that wasn't my intent. If they submit a new application, it'll be uh, processed the same way as any other new application would be. Next item on our agenda, we only have one item of new business, and that is to hear the request of Ted and, is it Evie, Evie? Evie. Evie. Ted and Evie West, 22 Reef Road, map U13, lot 8, to appeal the code enforcement officer's decision of denial of building permit number 030126, dated September 11, 2002. Um, are the Wests present this evening? They are. Person made and Evie West. You may take the podium, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is uh, Bill Plough. I'm with the uh, Portland law firm of Gumman, Woodsman, and McMahon. I'm here tonight on behalf of Ted and Evie West, who are the uh, appellants, if you will. Also uh, here tonight is uh, Joseph Waltman, the designer of the addition to the house, and he can answer any questions about the proposed addition. Uh, we're here uh, on an administrative appeal of Bruce Smith's denial of a building permit uh, to put an addition onto the house of Ted and Evie West. Uh, much of the house is within the shoreland zone setback. Uh, part of the addition to the house will be within the shoreland zone setback. Uh, it's my understanding that there's uh, no question, however, but that the addition is no closer to the water than the existing house. Uh, also no question uh, that the addition does not exceed the 30% expansion in square footage of volume that is noted in uh, the Cape Elizabeth Shoreland Zoning Ordinance. It is my understanding also that the uh, sole reason that um, Bruce Smith, and he can speak for himself obviously, uh, denied the permit was because of uh, this board's uh, finding in a case two years ago, the Caputo case, uh, interpreting the Shoreland Zoning Ordinance. So I see it as my job tonight to try to explain to you why um, the Wests should be uh, given a building permit for this expansion because it does indeed comply with your ordinance um, and respectfully that while I haven't looked at the facts involved in the Caputo matter in any detail, uh, suggest to you that um, the outcome in the Caputo matter may have established uh, a wrong interpretation uh, of the ordinance. Uh, I've given you a, a letter uh, through Bruce, which you may or may not have had time to read. I know I did send a copy uh, to the chairman of his law office. Hopefully he's had a chance to read it. But uh, essentially uh, is my understanding that um, the board was convinced two years ago in the Caputo matter that the Maine Supreme Court's opinion in Lewis versus Town of Rockport uh, compelled the board really to interpret the ordinance as it did. And that interpretation, as I understand it, is as follows. That any expansion uh, within the shoreland zone uh, in terms of a lateral expansion, a square footage expansion, is not allowed. The Lewis case uh, stands for this proposition. I'll go a little bit into the facts of Lewis and I I'll tell you up front that I'm, I've seen the Lewis property. Uh, I'm fairly familiar with the Lewis matter, although I didn't represent the town of Rockport in 1999 or 2098, I guess it was, when the case was decided. Uh, I do represent the town of Rockport now, and the case is still ongoing, believe it or not. There are four separate Superior Court cases. They've all been consolidated into one. The case has gone up to the main Supreme Court twice. In the first case, what I call Lewis I, which is the case that you are concerned about, uh, Justice Dana writing for the uh, court was interpreting the town of Rockport's ordinance with respect to sideline setback. And what happened was that the Maine Coast artists, who are the abutters to Lewis, um, went for a permit to get, um, in, under the Rockport ordinance, conditional use approval uh, on their non-conforming building. 
and what they proposed and what was approved by the town of uh, Rockport was what I call filling in. Their building was already non-conforming with respect to the sideline that they had with the Lewises. And um, they proposed to uh, put an addition onto the Main Coast Artist Building, but that addition would be no closer than the existing building was to the Lewis's sideline. I call this a, a filling in rule. Uh, Justice Dana called it the limit of nonconformity rule. And there were a lot of people, lawyers and code officers in the state, who felt that you were allowed to do this uh, under the main court's rules concerning non-conforming structures, that you're allowed to build up to the limit of non-conformity. And when that uh, reached the uh, law court, Justice Dana said, no, you can't do that because it is, in fact, quote, more non-conforming uh, than what was there before because it's taking up space within the red zone, if you want to call it, of the setback area. Uh, and Justice Dana was interpreting the language of the Rockport Ordinance, which said that you can get a conditional use from the Board of Appeals to expand a non-conforming structure as long as it's no more non-conforming. Justice said, Dana said no more non-conforming means just that, no more non-conforming, and you can't fill in, even though your fill in is no closer to the sideline of Lewis's than the Main Coast Artist Building was before. I agree with that. That decision, however, uh, does not compel uh, the denial of the West's permit because we are applying under the Cape Elizabeth Shoreland Zoning Ordinance, which is very different from the language in the Rockport Ordinance. The biggest difference is that the Shoreland Zoning Ordinance in Cape Elizabeth and virtually every other town, because the Cape Ordinance is essentially the model ordinance that's promulgated by the Maine Department of Environmental Protection, big difference is that the Cape Ordinance specifically allows expansion within the Shoreland Zone of a non-conforming structure, up to 30 percent. And as long as the expansion goes no closer to the water than what's already there. And that's the big difference. It specifically allows, it gives the landowners in Cape Elizabeth the right to expand up to 30 percent. Uh, and that's volume or square footage. In the West case, there is uh, no dispute about the 30% not being exceeded, and the addition is no closer to the water than the existing structure. So uh, under the CAPES ordinance, as well as the ordinances of the vast majority of towns around, uh, the expansion is allowed. What we're asking is really for you to um, uh, go back to what apparently was the interpretation of, of uh, Cape, town of Cape Elizabeth for many years prior to the Prudhoe case. Uh, I get that from Mike Hill's letter, which has been given to you. Mike Hill wrote a letter to Mike McGovern, and I think uh, Bruce has given you a copy of that uh, back in 2000 after the Caputo case. And Mike cites the fact that uh, this board, in fact, had interpreted the way uh, the Shoreland Zoning Ordinance as I just explained it for a long time before Caputo. Uh, I'm also asking you to apply the same interpretation that is applied by the Maine Department of Environmental Protection. We have a letter also from the year 2000 from Rich Baker, who is certainly one of the state authorities on shoreland zoning. He's the, the go-to person at the DEP for code officers around the state who are trying to interpret uh, the shoreland zoning ordinance, which again is based on a model that's actually drafted by the Maine DEP. Uh, so both the state uh, and we interpret the uh, ordinance as I'm proposing tonight, and I think Mike Hill was suggesting in his letter that that actually was the longstanding interpretation of the ordinance uh, before the Caputo case. So we're asking you to go back to the way that it has been interpreted for, for many years. Uh, the 30 percent expansion is clearly allowed uh, within, the shore, within the shoreland zone, and uh, it is a right that all the uh, landowners uh, in, the Cape, in the Cape have uh, if they have property in the shoreland zone. I'd be glad to try to answer any questions. Uh, I assume that you have copies of the uh, proposal of chilling the footprint and so forth. If not, I've got a copy here I could go through with you. Thank you, Mr. Plus. We do indeed have a copy of the uh, proposal showing the proposed, uh, the location of the proposed improvements. We have a copy of your letter. Thank you. Um, Three of us who are on the board tonight 
were on the board a couple years ago that made the decision in the Caputo case. Um, Mr. Keneally, uh, Mr. LaPlante, and I were part of that panel. Um, Dr. Chapmas and Mr. Trent Baglia were not part of that. Um, <coughs> I don't know the extent to which Mr. Trent Baglia or Dr. Chapmas have questions about this, but maybe I can sort of from a, the board's perspective, maybe or at least from my own, um, fill in a little bit for their benefit as well as, as well as yours and the board as a whole. When we were, when we first addressed this issue um, with regard to the Caputo request, what the board was trying to make sense of at the time was the same language that we have in the ordinance today. 19-4-4B1 um, which is on page 41 of our ordinance. Um, and what we were trying to square were two different sections of the ordinance, two different provisions. One which said the non-conforming structure may be added to or expanded provided that such addition or expansion does not increase the non-conformity of the structure, which seemed to be an absolute prohibition against any addition or expansion that would increase in non-conformity. We were trying to square that against another provision that referred to the ability um, to expand uh, floor area or volume uh, by not more than 30% during the lifetime of the structure. And the question that we discussed at length at that time was how do you square these two provisions um, when paragraph A, which as the 30% rule, doesn't say provided however, or notwithstanding the foregoing prohibition, um, it was how do you square these two things? Uh, do we read paragraph A as if it said notwithstanding the foregoing, you can expand by up to 30% during the lifetime? Or is, or we were reading it trying to square it with another um, interpretation, which is, is there a way you make sense of both of these? Is there a way that you can prohibit any addition or expansion so that you don't increase the nonconformity, but still, but still permit expansion of floor area or volume by an amount not to exceed 30%? Um, Mr. Hill was here at that hearing, advised us at the time, uh, my recollection is that the advice we were given at the time was it's ambiguous, reasonable minds could differ, and as legal counsel, that's about as far as I can go. The interpretation is yours. And um, we made an interpretation at that time. I hear what you're saying, and it makes perfect sense. Um, we did receive... Um, we had another matter before us about a year after the Caputo case. Um, and I don't know, Mr. Pluff, that you would have the benefit of, of this letter. Um, you probably don't. But um, for the benefit of the rest of the board, some of some of which members may have been here, may not have been on the board at the time. Well, many of you were. This is a letter from Mr. Hill dated July 19 of 2001 that was written to uh, Mr. Smith and was distributed to us at the time we were about to hear another matter involving uh, the construction of a uh, house on the Sprague property. And Well, let me just read this because I think it'll be beneficial for everybody and Mr. Puff for you also. And this is a letter to Mr. Smith and he says uh, from 
Mike Hill. And the letter is, Dear Bruce, you asked me to provide a letter for the benefit of the Zoning Board of Appeals regarding the above captioned issue. I understand that there is an application for the relocation of a structure filed by Julie Sprague, which is pending before the board and will be heard next week. This letter does not address Ms. Sprague's specific application, but is relevant to it. A few months ago, the board addressed the expansion of a non-conforming structure within the 75-foot setback in the shoreland zone. And he was referring, obviously, to the Caputo case. The board concluded that one could not expand the footprint of a structure within the 75-foot setback. In May, the law court, and he's writing this in July of 2001, in May, the law court decided a case dealing with the expansion of non-conforming structures within the setback area. The, the ordinance language in Rockport Plaza Realty versus City of Rockland, a copy of which is enclosed, is very similar to, to Cape Elizabeth's provisions regarding expansion of non-conforming structures in the shoreland zone, uh, section 19-4-4B. Although Rockland Plaza was not addressing the shoreland zone, its holding is instructive because of the similarity in the provisions. In Rockland Plaza, the zoning ordinance provided, quote, a non-conforming structure may be added to or expanded after obtaining a permit with the following conditions. The building coverage within each setback area, i.e. front, side, rear end, may be increased by no more than 30% during the lifetime of the structure, end quote. The ordinance also provided that, quote, in no case shall a structure be reconstructed or replaced so as to increase its nonconformity, end quote. The law court held that the more specific provision, which allowed expansions within the setback area, controlled over the broader language. Cape Elizabeth's ordinance dealing with enlargement of nonconforming buildings and structures within the shoreland district allows structures to be expanded, provided that the portion of the structure which does not exceed the required setback, quote, shall not be expanded in floor area or volume by more than 30% during the lifetime of the structure, end quote. Cape Elizabeth's ordinance also prohibits an expansion toward the water body. Given the law court's decision in the Rockland Plaza case, it is our opinion that non-conforming structures within the 75-foot setback of the shoreland zone may be expanded so long as they meet the requirements of section 19-4-4B1A and B with respect to the 30% limit and going no closer to the water body. Signed, Monahan Leahy by Michael Hill. So I guess the point being that that letter which was written, um, about a year after the Caputo case, just about exactly a year after the July 5, 2000 letter that you have a copy of, uh, was based on what was um, a then fairly recent decision of the Maine Supreme Court. And it seems to me that our legal counsel is telling us that based on that decision that the that he, would, that he would have advised us differently if the Caputo case had come before us at that time. Um, at least that's the way I hear his letter, that he would be telling us today if he were here that we should grant the request um, of your clients. So although we were told two years ago that reasonable minds could differ um, the way I read Mr. Hill's letter, he is saying that based on a case that came down a little later, that the ambiguity needs to be resolved in favor of reading it, reading the 30% expansion rule as an exception to the prohibition. Let me uh, read from Page. This is page 3-5-1 in the Board of Appeals Manual, um, which is talking about expansion, uh, expanding non-conforming structures revisited, and specifically here we're talking about uh, the Supreme Court's response to the Lewis case. Um, it says the Lewis case has important consequences for planning boards and boards of appeals in interpreting zoning ordinances generally. <clears throat> 
many of which incorporate the concept of expansion of nonconforming structures and allow it as long as the expansion creates no greater nonconformity. It says, however, unless an ordinance defines, quote, no more conforming, unquote, more liberally, the restrictive Lewis definition will control. And I believe that's what we were relying upon in the case of the Caputo decision two years ago. And what is that that you're? It's page three dash five dash one out of this thing. May I, may I respond to that or? Oh, please. Yes. Yeah. So looking for all the information we can get. Okay. Um, that I think reading from the uh, Maine Municipal Association manual for uh, yes. boards of appeals. Yeah. Um, That's right. And uh, again, that is addressing, and I think um, I know the Lewis case was addressing uh, the situation of a sideline setback provision in an ordinance that did not have a specific allowed expansion provision in it. And that's what we have in Sherland zoning, specific language allowing expansions up to 30%. And I obviously agree with Mike Hill's letter written in 2001 um, and would echo um, what he was saying about the, uh, the law court's opinion, which is that in interpreting ordinances, um, the specific generally controls over the general. And in fact, um, if you just read the uh, language that the chairman read out of, out of your ordinance, the first sentence saying no expansions allowed, then the second provision, that subparagraph on the 30% would be what we call surplus, it would be without meaning. It would be there serving no purpose. And the courts will always try to interpret statutes and ordinances uh, so that the legislative body that enacted them would have provided meaning uh, to the ordinance. They don't enact things without meaning. So. I think that's the, the general rule of ordinance and statutory construction that the law court was enunciating in the Rockport, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, it's the Rockport Plaza versus the city of Rockland case. Uh, and it is a general rule of statutory construction, which can also be applied here. And I don't see that as being at all inconsistent with the MMA uh, manual commentary on, on uh, the Lewis case. I, I, there's more here that I haven't read, but let me just read one more paragraph. Um, it said, the court's decision could affect interpretation of Shoreland zoning ordinance as well. While Lewis did not directly address the expansion of non-conforming structures under Shoreland zoning, a possible reading of Lewis is that for an expansion under the 30% rule uh, for structures or portions of structures within the required water setback, no lateral or vertical expansion along the most non-conforming portion of the structure is permitted. This runs counter to the long-time interpretation by both DEP and municipalities that expansion is allowed along a structure to the extent of any grandfathered encroachment into the required, required setback. The phrase increase in non-conformity is not defined in the Shoreland Zoning Statute or the state's minimum Shoreland Guidelines. However, so the Lewis definition threatens the continued validity of this traditional interpretation. So it seems like it's still a very gray matter unless an individual municipality adopts the formal definition of that phrase. And to the best of my knowledge, we have not done that, Kate Elizabeth. And I mean, you might even go further, Jack, and continue to read the final paragraph of that. In light of Lewis, boards should be careful in applying ordinance provisions governing expansion of non-conforming structures. Boards may wish to recommend that their legislative bodies adopt a more flexible definition of, quote, no more non-conforming, unquote, or a similar standard if the municipality wants to avoid the result in the Lewis case. Shoreland Zoning Ordinances, DEP, is proposing a change to the state's minimum shoreland guidelines that would provide a more liberal standard for municipalities wishing to incorporate it into their ordinances. On the other hand, it is not necessary to amend local ordinance to add a definition. Some municipalities may agree with the result, result in Lewis and not want to liberalize their ordinances. So to the best of my knowledge, the town of Cape Elizabeth has not done anything to modify 
its ordinances are to formally define the phrase no more nonconforming in response to this particular situation. And I believe that's the situation that we had thrust into our lap two years ago and that we still sit with here today. Except that you have the Rockland Plaza, uh, the Rock, City of Rockland case uh, from the law court uh, further refining, if you will, the holding in Lewis. Um, and you have really the weight of authority from the main DEP being reaffirmed uh, by Rich Baker, who I said is the probably the authority in the state on shoreland zoning ordinance, ordinances. Uh, and in my experience, it's actually uh, unusual for a municipal legislative body to go back and, and uh, um, revise the shoreland zoning ordinance in light of one decision um, uh, from, a, from a board of appeals, especially when the decision um, has been questioned by the by the town attorney, if you will, and I, I recognize I'm talking to three of the people who made the decision in the, at the time. Right. Um, but and I guess what I'm saying is that uh, there have been further developments which would suggest that there really is no need to, to amend the current ordinance in, uh, in Cape Elizabeth. And um, I think the, the other thing I would point out is that uh, while MMA provides general guidance in their documents it's not really intended to be legal advice to uh, to the towns. You have your own town attorneys for that. Right. To the best of my understanding, there is still some ambiguity uh, associated with the interpretation of this. Um, my recollection of the Caputo case and the arguments before us in the Caputo case um, by uh, the opposing attorney, um, Mrs. Armstrong, uh, Mrs. Armstrong referred, and I cannot put my finger on it right now, and I hope that we still have it in the complete records, to some guidance from the state to zoning boards that when one deals with the case of extreme ambiguities, in the case of Shoreland zoning application for variances, the most conservative interpretation should apply. I, I know I felt strongly swayed by that argument before us at that time. And I have a very strong recollection of that because I, I recall about a month later when the same letter came to us from DEP, I, I said, what's this? I mean, we're, we were following state guidance about conservative interpretation. Now they're telling us that we shouldn't have done it. So, so I, I wish I could find the specific guidance that she pointed to. Well, it actually, actually the, uh, it's, it's interesting. One, I, I don't know what she was talking about because the state does not really provide guidance to local zoning boards. The Maine Municipal Association does. Um, well, perhaps it was that, yeah. Yeah, and the, the rule actually is the obverse of that. Um, when there's ambiguity that involves restriction on private property rights, uh, in fact, the ambiguity should be resolved uh, in, in many cases, I'm not going to say every case, but in many cases, uh, in favor of the property owner. When there's ambiguity in the language of the ordinance itself. Then that's a general. That's right. right. Now that's not to say that property owners don't come before you with a burden of proof to show that, for example, they deserve a variance. Right. Or that I don't come before you tonight with the burden of, of saying that Bruce made an error when he denied it. Um, uh, the, West, the West permit. Um, but Joe, did, did you have something that you wanted to say? Well, I, I'm sorry, you won't be able to speak from there. You'll need to come up to the podium so we have you on the microphone. But one, one thing to, as a follow-up to Mr. Keneally's statement, um, our own ordinance, section 19-10-1, titled Conflict with Other Provisions, does say, whenever a provision of this ordinance conflicts with or is inconsistent with another provision of this ordinance, or any other ordinance, regulation, or statute, the more restrictive and specific provision shall control. And that's a common provision in ordinances. And it's a right. common provision to have that in your subdivision ordinance and in your zoning ordinance. That's a different, different concept from where there's an ambiguity. Uh, the landowner's rights should be taken into account. Let's put it and there. then we're also left with the common interpretive guidance that says that we should try to harmonize conflicting provisions so that we give meaning to all provisions 
That's and right. not read anything out as a nullity. That's right. Um, so, I mean, what you're hearing is <clears throat> some of the internal debate that we had two years ago, and it is still there. I wanted to read Mike Hill's July 2001 letter just as an, an indication of what, how I read the legal advice that we were getting. The burden still falls on the board to interpret our ordinance. Um, but I simply thought that it was important that the board hear what our own legal counsel was telling us about his own reading of the ordinance. Now, I did read, I mean, in light of Mr. Hill's letter, I did read the Rockland Plaza case. Um, and I'm not sure that his reading of it is as clear as the letter suggests, merely because that case involved some expansions, but it also involved um, eliminating some existing nonconformities. And the court's decision, I mean, in, in reading the concluding paragraphs of Rockland Plaza, um, the court says, these renovations and expansions actually reduce the nonconformity of Ellsworth Builders parcel rather than increase it. Um, and I can't help but wonder how much that swayed the court in its decision, the fact that even though there was some increase, there was actually a net decrease in the nonconformity, and therefore they were going to permit the expansion. Um, so I think we're still in this gray area without any clear guidance. I know what the state interpretation is. And your interpretation is not an unreasonable one, Mr. Plough. And I know that there are other municipalities that agree with you. I would suggest the, the vast, vast majority. As a matter of fact, this is the first time I've ever encountered and, this and, interpretation. And I understand we may be the only one. <laughs> and you may well be, is my suggestion. Who, at least based on our decision two years ago, um, didn't agree. Right. It's yet to be seen whether we still don't. Right. <laughs> and I think that you put your finger on the uh, one of the key concepts here of ordinance construction, which is to stick with the Caputo interpretation, you have to read out of the ordinance the 30% rule paragraph. It well, I don't becomes, think so. It becomes surplusage, and the only way to, to harmonize them is to, um, to give that some meaning. We, we did harmonize that by saying you can still increase volume. You could still add a floor, but you can't increase the footprint. Did you know that in the Lewis case, involved vertical as well as horizontal nonconformities? Yes. All right. So I'm not quite sure how you would have reached that conclusion in Caputo, but I wasn't here in Caputo. Well, I don't think they had a, uh, I don't think they had a 30% rule. No, they didn't. That's right. In that to case. the extent that we are talking about both volume and square footage. Could I ask Joe if he, yes, you want to make means. comment? Yes. And if you would state your name and address, please. Um, my name is Joe Walton. I live in Yarmouth, Maine. Um, and I did some of the plans for the Wests. Um, it, I may be incorrect on this, but I don't believe that I am, that in, in or about 1989, the Shoreland setback was 25 feet. And it was a, it was a restriction that would have come under the, the no, uh, no expansion whatsoever rule and that the rule in your ordinance that says no increase in nonconformity was intended and written previous to that and, in, and intended for rear line, side line, and oceanfront setbacks before there was shoreland zoning. In 19, I think it was 1989, because I know that I, I had to uh, start a building on uh, Shore Road for uh, Mr. Moody, who eventually Mr. Keenan bought it because the shoreland setback was going to change. But at that time, it was called the um, setback from the ocean or whatever, setback from a body of water. So my point is that simultaneously with taking the setback and going from 25 feet to 75 feet, there was a, there was a, a new set of rules specifically for shoreland zoning 
that, um, that, that had the new language with the 30% rule. So I think that it's fairly, it's not much of a reach to see that the old rule, the old interpretation um, was for a different situation and that when the shoreland zoning was brought in, that it was not analogous um, or parallel with the um, conditions for the side rear and former oceanfront setback. What, what Joe was saying, I think, is consistent with what the ordinance says. The copy I have anyway, which I got off your website, indicates that uh, B1A, which starts off after January 1, 1989, and B1B were both adopted by the Cape Elizabeth Council effective August 11, 1999. Um, and if you take the first sentence, which apparently pre-existed, 1A and 1B. Uh, at one time, that may have been in there as an absolute prohibition. However, that absolute prohibition was modified by the addition of 1A and 1B, effective August 11, 1999. And again, uh, we have to give meaning to that August 1999 enactment. Um, but I think that's how we got to what you see as an ambiguity, that you had the one sentence at the beginning of B1, enlargement, absolute prohibition, and then that got modified by A and B. It appears that that's the way the ordinance was structured, how we came to the structure of the ordinance as we're wrestling with it tonight. And by the way, I very, very much appreciate your willingness to kind of revisit something that was, that was done before and you really look into this. Well, we're glad to do it. I mean, it's, it's it's kind of a, I mean, I think only lawyers would appreciate this, but I think <laughs> it's kind of a fun exercise to torture yourself with this occasionally. <laughs> um, I, I would feel a lot better about this if paragraph A started out with by saying, notwithstanding the foregoing. I think that would be easy. Um, But I, I, maybe that needs to be read into there by implication. Um, does anybody else want yeah, like, to chime in on this? Uh, I'd like to, uh, I appreciate your long letter here, which we did have a little bit of time to, to read. If I turn to page two of your letter, the first mm -hmm. paragraph says, the board, of course, is not bound by precedent in the same way as a fellow courts are bound by the principle of, and I won't try to pronounce that, how would you pronounce that? <laughs> Stare decisis. Stare decisis? Decisis. Decisis, okay. If I remember my Latin um, correctly. Administrative bodies are subject to examination of their decisions for being arbitrary and capricious. Um, now, as you know as well as we do, the zoning board is considered not purely an administrative but a quasi-judicial body. And that's the, right? So we don't strictly follow a case law the same way a purely judicial body does. But I think there is some value here in a consistency approach to things. And that's the thing that I'm struggling <coughs> with right now in terms of we made an interpretation. We didn't recognize until after the fact that it was somewhat of a unique interpretation, maybe a totally unique interpretation. Uh, we believed at the time it was one valid interpretation. And at the time, we believed it was the best interpretation we could make. And so in my mind, there is some value at this point in being consistent with that interpretation. And I am certainly, I would certainly welcome a judicial court review of our decision and interpretation, because ultimately that will clear the whole thing up. But my feeling at this point is that I feel somewhat bound to adopt a consistent approach to the same question when it raises itself more than once. And otherwise, if I don't do that, I feel I am being arbitrary and capricious, which is what I'm saying we shouldn't be. Um, well, I, my inclination is to simply, you know, make a decision based on consistency in a very similar situation to what we had two years ago. Well, what I meant by that part of my letter was that a court um, would not take you to task for um, finding in one case 
differently from the way you found two years ago if you, if you believe that you were in error two years ago. Certainly, if you sit here tonight and in your heart of hearts or in your mind think, I was right two years ago, that is the right interpretation. Well, I believe there's more than one right interpretation. I believe we made one correct, valid interpretation. It was an unusual one. You recognize that. But I, I don't believe that it was wrong. Well, going back again, perhaps to, if, if you don't feel it's wrong, then I, then you don't feel it's wrong, even in light of the, um, this issue of, of landowner rights in the realm of ambiguity, uh, taking some precedence. But what I was going to say was that if you feel, upon further reflection, that the uh, especially as informed by these later law, by the later law court opinion and informed by Mike Hill's advice and Rich Baker's advice, if you feel that the decision in Caputo was wrong, no court would ever question you for changing your mind tonight. I know, I understand that. And when they talk about arbitrary and capricious, the very few cases which look at that issue in the context of planning boards and boards of appeals look for a pattern and then a deviation from the pattern whereas an appellate court on stare decisis is legally bound by precedent unless they vote to overrule uh, earlier precedent. So even, even courts, the US Supreme Court, uh, notwithstanding years of, and thank heavens that they do this because there are some decisions of the United States Supreme Court in many years gone by that we wouldn't want to be part of the jurisprudence of the 21st century. They realized they were wrong they will overrule themselves. And that certainly is an option uh, for you, but you're not bound in the same way that, that courts are uh, at all. <clears throat> yes, sir, would you state your name and address for us, please? Yes, I'm Mr. Robert Armitage, 18 Reef Road, and I'm not here to speak either for or against. I I'm sorry, would you spell your last name for us? A R M. I-T-A-G-E. Thank you. Um, I'm not here to speak either for or against necessarily, but um, this raises an issue, and I believe the council can correct me. I know I've talked with uh, Bruce Smith today, and it seems to me as though we have an issue here with regarding shoreline zoning, and there's a permitting process with the DEP, and I don't understand why it isn't a requirement uh, before people come to the expense of, of this to have that in hand. Uh, in other words, Bruce has indicated that's something that the town informs the, the property owner that there is to notify the DEP. Um, I am also an architect, so I have been caught in this same kind of a scenario. And before a building inspector would issue a permit or even consider a building, uh, I was required to get a permit from the DEP and apply for a permit. In this particular case, it was adjacent to or nearby a stream. And so once I had that, we had a meeting with the building inspector and the DEP representative and went through that process and, and it was okay. The, the Wests are attempting to build within uh, an imaginary 75 foot line from a beach area. Uh, it would seem to me as though if they were to apply for a permit to do that, and the DEP would have come out, they would be able to give them as well as you some indication as to how critical that is. And then the variance would be uh, an issue for you to deal with uh, with regards to conformity, nonconformity. But uh, that's my only comment. I just felt that I think we have two things here. Uh, uh, and there is a permitting process, which I think that's the town should require, just as it does in talking with Bruce, for example, uh, uh, with the state fire marshal's office where uh, places of public assembly require a permit from the fire marshal's office. And in this case, uh, people want to build in, in, in uh, uh, shoreline zoning, then uh, go to the DEP, get the permit, and we would be sitting here, and if the DEP didn't find a problem with what they want to do, uh, I think we as neighbors uh, wouldn't find a problem. It's the process. And I 
I do have problems with some of the things that have gone on in the past in the neighborhood in the sense that I don't think the people have gotten a DEP permit, and it's an after-the-fact kind of a thing. Uh, so that's my only... Thank Mr. You. Smith, is a... Well, wait, don't, don't leave yet. <laughs> uh, Mr. Smith, is there a DEP permit required for this kind of construction? There are some activities within, within a shoreland setback that, that would require what we call an NRPA permit by rule, such as if you were doing an addition within 75 feet and you're disturbing soil, you'd have to apply for a soil disturbance permit, uh, which is a 14-day application waiting period. You don't hear from the DEP within 14 days, you go ahead with your project. So it isn't necessary approval for the building itself. It's related activities that may require some kind of permitting from DEP as a result of um, for instance, in this case, a building permit. No requirement for this town or any town to wait for that permit by rule to come in. We, we are obligated to inform them they need, they may need uh, certain permits from the state, um, which we do, we do tell them. And if we can, through the line, if we find that, that they don't have a permit, then, then we call DEP and, and inform <laughs> the owner that they may be in violation. But that's, that's as far as our obligation goes. But your suggestion, if I hear it correctly, is that the town should consider requiring that any construction within the 75-foot setback require DEP approval? Yeah. If, unfortunately, your comments aren't being picked up. Um, But am I correct in understanding what your suggestion was? Yes, I think if there's something within shoreline uh, zoning area that the DEP, it should, and there's a permitting process, would certainly make it easier for, for uh, Bruce to uh, not have to go through this. I mean, if you come in here with a permit and the DEP doesn't find something seriously wrong with what you're trying to do, I think it would preclude some of the conversation tonight. And that, would, that would be my feeling. In other words, if, if the owner's done everything they can to satisfy the state's requirements as it regards shoreline zoning, because that's where it came from, uh, you know, and I believe Cape Elizabeth even has more restrictive uh, shoreline zoning. I think it was back to 150 feet or something. I might even go further than that. I'm not sure. And from what I understand, Mr. Smith's comments to me is that in this case, DEP doesn't even have to be consulted. So I assume the DEP wouldn't have any objection. I, I, I wouldn't know unless, uh, you know, I know, for example, if you want to rip wrap a beach, if you want to build a, a dock, there's all these different things that DEP has applications for, okay? In, my, in the particular case that I was involved in, there was a, a drainage ditch that went by a house. And because it had running water three months out of the year, I was required to apply for a permit. I don't know whether it was... $50 and wrote up something, took some pictures, had the man come down and inspect it. And he, of course, when he came down, there was no water in it. And, <laughs> you know, we went through the process. It's a process. But at that point, I was able to show the building inspector that this was not an issue. Uh, and I'm not, in this particular case, uh, quite frankly, living down in that area, um, I, I question whether it's a serious issue. I mean, I realize there's an, a line that cuts through a part of the house that's within 75 feet, and the front part doesn't hit the 75 feet, okay? But the new addition does only because of the contours of a beach area. But if the DEP comes down and says it's not a, a major problem, uh, then what are we talking about, really? You know, oh, uh, other than the zoning ordinance. Yeah. Well, your point is well taken, yeah. but we're, yeah, but you're exactly right. We're talking about the zoning ordinance. Yes, but I'm trying to uh, 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 help uh, with the issue of the shoreline zoning as it relates to the state as well, because that's where it's coming from, and the DEP. Okay. Thank you for your comments. Is there anyone else who would like to speak to this? i make a comment. Apparently, at one time, the state required... Board of Appeals to send copies of all shoreland zoning variance applications 
to the Department of Environmental Protection for a review and comment at least 20 days prior to action on the application by the board. This is no longer a requirement, though. But shoreland zoning ordinances do require that a variance, that variance decisions be filed with the DEP within a certain number of days from the date of the decision. And DEP staff can then uh, apply its judgment to it. So apparently there's been a change in the law relating to the way the DEP gets its opinions uh, weighed into the process here. And I think that reinforces Bruce's earlier comments that I think it's a 14-day period, you said, and you file, and if you don't hear back, you can take that as their approval. That's correct. I would like to say a couple things. I'm not sure if it's the appropriate time, but um, I denied the, the permit for the West. I'd like to go on the record stating this uh, simply because of the, of the decision of the board. Uh, I'm not going to defend that denial because I believe now, as I believed before, that the language that's in the ordinance is the same identical language. It was not only in shoreland minimum guidelines, but in every ordinance probably throughout the state, um, and has been since 89. That said, I, I think it's fairly obvious, or was fairly obvious in 2000, that, that because um, I had been interpreting that for 12 years as a code officer in four different towns, as other code officers had also with the same language, that that, um, that that should have been the decision, and that's why I issued the permit originally, uh, and that's why I will not defend the denial at this point. That's about all I need to say on that all right. issue. I, I understand that's been a situation for two years now, um, and I the thing that I have to fall back on is that the council, we, the advice we have from our council, from Mike Gill, was the best that I interpreted was that we made a decision that was a valid one valid. And I'm not arguing that it wasn't a valid decision, Jack. And I, I realized, didn't realize at the time. I subsequently realized that it's a very precedent-setting decision. But to the best of my reading of things and reading of advice from town council, is we did not make a wrong decision. And based on that, I believe that we have some responsibility to be consistent in the way we make decisions. So, and, and I, again, I really very much welcome the court to ultimately you know, decide and whether I, or not we've made a wrong or incorrect or inappropriate decision. Right. And, I, and I'm, not, I'm not arguing that point. I, I think it's important to, 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 for the board to at least weigh um, the interpretation of the code officer, not only this code officer, but preceding code officers, and look at the language that hasn't been changed and, and, and have weigh that heavily in any decision they may make, not only on this particular issue, but any issue that may be in the audience. I think it's important to have a relationship with a code officer to that extent, just like I think it's important for the code officer to understand that the board interprets as they did in 2000 and that I'm not going to go against the wishes of the board because they, they're the final say. But I think it's important to have that relationship and understand the importance of both functions. Um, DEP in their letter does recognize, Rich Baker does recognize that, that the, 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 the definition should be tightened up, not in, in our audience, but maybe in every other audience that's got the similar language realizes that this could be an issue, and it has been. Um, the town didn't jump on us in 2000 to change it because there was no driving force to do so. Uh, maybe that's where it should lie, but I think until then, I think it's important to understand the relationship between the prior interpretation and what the board decides. Thank you. Well, I agree with um, Mr. Keneally's comments that it is important that the board at least try and be consistent where it's appropriate to be consistent. Um, um, however, I don't want to be consistent uh, just for the purpose of being consistent. Uh, and in this case, um, I think I'm inclined to follow the advice of our council, um, who sent us a letter a year later although 
again, he advises at the time that he thought it was reasonable to go either way when a year later he advises us that it's, again, reading, quoting from his July 19, 2001 letter, he says, it is our opinion that non-conforming structures within the 75-foot setback of the shoreland zoning, of the shoreland zone may be expanded so long as they meet the requirements of 19-4-4B1A and B with respect to the 30% limit and going no closer to the water body. Now this is the same legal counsel that's going to defend any decision we make. Um, and he's telling us pretty clearly up front what his opinion is. Um, and I really don't want to put him in the position of having to have him defend a contrary position uh, to his opinion. Um, if it means we've made inconsistent decisions over a two-year period, I can live with that. Um, if it means that somebody else comes back and asks us to change a decision that we made two years ago, I can live with that too. Um, but I feel some obligation to follow the advice of our legal counsel. Good point. Comments? Well, actually, uh, I don't know if it was, I was not on the, uh, on the council two years ago, so to a certain degree I can sort of look back and uh, I, th I found this to be very interesting and the things that came to mind, I don't think your decision was an incorrect decision two years ago. I think it was one interpretation, a very conservative one, and I've always felt being the novice here that I think the purpose, you know, if everything was black and white, there'd be no need for this board. And I think I, I don't have any of the particulars of that particular case. I don't know what the footprint of that building was or what they were trying to do. But when I looked in context to this particular application and I read the, this section of the ordinance for the first time, I mean, it made sense to me. And I wrote down, I looked at this home, and I said, well, it's if you, it, it, the largest diameter and, and the largest the length or width, and if you sort of fill in the blocks, I mean, the house structurally doesn't change and the volume is within 30%, and the new height is going, to be un is going to be three feet less than the existing structure of the home, and all that's on the opposite side of the water, my initial reading was, I don't understand why this was, was denied, and then I was doing this retrospective reading in, into the previous uh, uh, records, and I don't have all the particulars of that, so I don't want to say it was an incorrect decision, but looking at the merits of this particular case and sort of a fresh reading um, of the ordinance, um, I'm sort of hard pressed on why it would be denied outside of, I guess, the, the town's history. But I, I think you can argue um, I guess I really can't comment on that case. Just looking at this particular case, I, I, I just think that this is a reasonable request for a building permit. And within our ordinance. You think earlier we heard from, I'm sorry if I mispronounce your last name, but is it Plow? Plow. Plow. I think earlier we heard from you in section B1A that that was the initial code or the, I'm sorry, the initial, initial ordinance. And after January 1st, 89, the subsequent paragraphs are added, and it seems that those, by their addition, mean to carry additional weight. And I'm finding that argument being reinforced by Mr. Smith's comments and also by Michael Hill's letters, that it's the intent of the ordinance that A carry perhaps more weight in our decision and it seems to be in alignment with what the appellates are asking for. Dr. Chapman, do you want to weigh in? <clears throat> I was not a member of the board in 2000, so I comment somewhat as an outsider. Uh, well, I think that can be helpful. Based on several issues, the uh, information that I've read regarding this in the ordinance. The letter from Mr. Hill, July 5, 2000, where he recites 
our ordinance, 19.4.B.1.B. He recites that, and then he goes on to state that this language has always been interpreted by the town as well as other towns in the main department of environmental protection as meaning that a structure could be expanded, including footprint, within the 75 feet as long as it does not violate the 30 percent rule and so long as the expansion was not toward the water body. Uh, based on what I've read in my interpretation of the ordinance, I feel like that is uh, the overlying ruling that, that I uh, interpret this as and envision this as, uh, which goes on to support that as long as it is not toward the body of water, then, then it is acceptable. And uh, again, that's supported by the council, Mr. Hill. I do have some specific factual questions regarding this property when the time comes. I'd like to address those. Okay, well, I think this is probably the right time to do that. I don't know who to address these to, uh, whether uh, it's. Uh, Mr. Uh, Waltman, you're probably the most appropriate person to answer these. best I can. The, the existing house does not, the, the existing dwelling, does it have any basement at all? Yes, it does. Is it living space basement? Is it use, used as living space? Um, no, it's um, not used as living space, and uh, they don't intend to use it as living space. However, it is a fairly typical basement um, in parts of the building. In, well, in the, part, in the original part of the building, which is 90% of the building, not counting the garage. Uh, crawl space of sorts. No, it's a, um, about six, eight headroom. No, you can walk around down there. But the addition does not have in, uh, any basement, just frost wall as described. That's correct. In the application. Uh, the survey, the standard boundary survey that was presented references top of bank as noted in 1997. Do you know the incidents that precipitated that definition and by whom the top of the bank was defined? I believe the West had a, an erosion problem and they um, got the necessary permits um, to put riprap and uh, fill in a certain area. Um, and that actually changed the shoreline. Do you know who defined top of bank at that time? Who defined? The same surveyor defined both, uh, both lines, okay. uh, which was Royal River Survey. It was not defined or ruled upon by the Code Enforcement Office. In conjunction? It was c defined in conjunction with the Code Enforcement Officer. Uh, do you... Since there was no elevation profile presented as part of the plans, can you please describe that in, in view of the two additions? Um, I actually have elevations, but the, uh, um, the, the existing uh, gable facing the beach, uh, maybe I can describe it better with a picture. No. Nope. I don't know. I don't know if you can see that far. But this this gable exists. Um, this is the addition. This is the original house in the background. This is primarily the addition in question. There's another small addition on the other side. This line. Uh, is that the garage side? This is the garage side. This is uh, this is the addition. This was already there. Um, so the primary, the two additions are this little piece of garage, which is faces the street. This is the side of it, which is about 10 feet wide and covers an already paved area. And this is filling in according to the plan. Um, this gable and this gable are 90 degrees to each other. So there, there's a valley 
uh, and all we did was duplicate the gable that's already there. So in, in all additions, we're lower than the, um, the current building by four or five feet. So we tried to make a low impact deck of parts of the other house, more or less, that we're using. Is that probably as clear as I can make it, I guess. Similar roofing material, same roofing material. Pardon me? The, it, it, it'll be the same roof type material. Yes. I Do you know if that property has a one-story deed restriction on it? Yes, it, it, I do. It, We're not adding any second story. But there exists today a one-story deed restriction. I know there is a one-story deed restriction, yes, okay. which is part of the reason you need to, you can't add to anything but the footprint. And the last comment I have, uh, on the addendum titled West Square Footage and Volume that was issued as part of the original application for building permit uh, regarding the expansion. Mr. Smith's aware of this. Uh, you, I assume you prepared this. Uh, yep. Uh, both a square footage comparison and a volume comparison of, uh, for expansion. Uh, listing ori original area within the 75 foot previous edition and proposed and you do the same for the volume. It appears that the volume <coughs> expansion uh, falls under is less than the 30 percent expansion allowed. However, based on the figures that you provided, uh, original area within the 75 foot setback, 2,002 square feet. A uh, 30 percent expansion would be 600 feet, 600.6 .6 square feet. Your previous and proposed additions <clears throat> add up to 624 square feet, which appears to exceed the 30 percent square foot expansion. Could you please explain that? I believe that uh, that uh, the that only 398 square feet of that is in the 75 foot. So part of the expansion isn't, um, isn't within the 75 foot. This is not labeled as such. It says, <clears throat> excuse me, original area within 75 foot setback, 2002 square feet. Previous addition area within 75 foot setback, 226 square feet. Proposed addition area within 75 foot setback, 398 square feet. Yes. Uh, 226 square feet plus 398 square feet equals 624 square feet, which exceeds the 600 foot limit of the 30 percent expansion. I guess we'll have to make it smaller. That's a, I'm, I didn't catch that. Mr. Smith's aware of this. This is not the overlying issue. Uh, that were addressed, but it's certainly a subordinate issue uh, uh, that, that will come into play based on our uh, ruling on the administrative appeal, and I would like that addressed. Yes. Um, we certainly would uh, shrink the addition within the 75 feet square footage-wise to make it conform. That's all the questions I have. Thank you. Well, Dr. Chapman, you got my attention with that. Um, Let's add up the numbers that you just uh, recited. I'm reading off the addendum label of West Square Footage and Volume. Original area within 75 foot setback is 2,002 square feet. Right. Previous addition area within 75 foot setback, 226 square feet. Proposed additions, additions with air. Uh, area within 75 foot setback, 398 square feet. 200, 
taking the previous area of 226 square feet plus the proposed additions of 398 square feet come to a total of 624 square feet of proposed addition over the lifetime of the expansion or the property. And that, according to the 30% rule, is limited to 30% of the 2,002 square feet over the lifetime of the property, which would be a total of 600 square feet, 0.6, 600.6 square feet. So it appears to exceed so addition of combined addition of 24 square feet. 23.4. According to the 30% rule. Thank you for doing the math. Because I had not checked the square footage. Thank you. I think uh, excuse me, I think that uh, we have a corrected version that you don't have, and that the 226 square feet was the total addition, um, and that uh, there's a later calculation that I didn't, uh, that I think Bruce and I went over because there's notes from you, that the previous addition, only 112 square feet of it, is within the 75 feet. And so we had, <coughs> I, I'm embarrassed about that. I didn't personally do the calculation, so I'm a little bit of a loss, but this, I do think that's the case. So. This is, <coughs> This is an issue between you and Mr. Smith to deal with uh, subsequent to our ruling on, on this. I just pointed that out as a procedural issue that uh, based on these numbers, there is some modification that will need to take place, whether it's a typographical error or what, or right. structural error. But that is, that's not for us to rule on tonight, but that is an issue that would preclude it based on the information provided. Uh, factually being approved under the 30% rule, and I wanted to point that out. Thank you. Any other discussion within the board? Would anyone like to make a motion? Attempt a motion. Um, Mr. Trent Bagley, yeah. Yes, in the, um, in the matter of the administrative appeal of Ted and Evie West regarding um, appeal of Code Enforcement Office denial of building permit number 030126, dated 9-11-2002, I move that uh, we uh, approve uh, this administrative appeal and allow <clears throat> the building permit to be in effect. Or to allow the building permit to be issued. Issued. Do we have a second for the motion? Mr. LaPlante, second. Uh, discussion on the motion. I thought you made a compelling argument. Well, I thought you made a fairly compelling argument. But uh, I, think, I think the argument that Mr. Hill has weighed in one year ago um, makes it difficult, if not impossible, for him to argue effectively supporting the decision that we made two years ago, if he has to argue that um, based on an appeal. So I will support this. Other comments? 
Hearing no other discussion, all those in favor? The motion is approved by a vote of five in favor, zero opposed. Thank you very much. You're welcome. That concludes our new business. Next item on the agenda is communications. Do we have any, Mr. Smith? I have none, no. Do we have a motion for adjournment? So moved. Mr. LaPlante, second, Mr. Keneally, all those in favor? We are adjourned by a vote of five in favor, zero opposed.